I switch stools because you were taller than me earlier. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to keep the kids in uh, for just a, a few minutes here while Cassidy is sharing a little bit, um, and then we'll dismiss after that. But uh, a couple weeks ago, I, I introduced Cassidy uh, to you verbally that she's going to join us. She is uh, a candidate for our youth ministry position and uh, spending the weekend with us, with us here, and she's going to share a little bit of her testimony uh, right now, and then um, she'll be around after the service. You want to uh, say hi, introduce yourself to her. She'd love to meet you, and then tonight she will be at uh, the Refuge Youth Ministry um, with our both our junior high and senior high from 6 to 8, um, so our, all of our uh, students are welcome and invited to come tonight, um, and then also parents, if you want to come and hear a little bit of the Q&A that's going to happen tonight. Uh, I invite you to do that as well. So, uh, Cassidy, would you go ahead and share with us? Yeah, hi. So, um, it's great to uh, meet everybody, see a few more faces. I'm Cassidy. Uh, I'm from originally Southern California, born and raised. Please don't hold it against me. Um, so, uh, my kind of faith background, I grew up in the nominal, wow, non-denominational church, and that was kind of my primary source of discipleship and intentional Bible teaching and growth in my young years. I grew up in a fairly nominally Christian home, so all of my teaching and discipleship and Bible teaching and prayer really happened in the local church, so I have just such a heart for the body and the bride of Christ and the discipleship and teaching that goes on there. My faith uh, originally started when I was about seven years old. That's when I, as much as a seven-year-old can, really kind of understood uh, that I'm a sinner and that I need Jesus and that we need to come to him and that he created us and that he loves us And then I went through a significant period of doubt and struggle and Wondering how a good God can allow some of the things in the world that we see to happen And so I kind of went through this season of really struggling with my faith and not really understanding Who God was through all of it and then my faith ultimately kind of took a 180 turn back and I recognized that I don't just need Jesus as my Savior but I need him as my Lord and that that's a good thing and that he is beautiful and he is glorious and amazing and loving. And my faith really became my own when I was about 15 at the end of my freshman year of high school. And that's when I really understood what it meant for the first time to pick up my own cross and die to myself and follow after Christ and to pursue him in my relationships with other people, even when it's inconvenient and even when it's uncom uncomfortable and awkward and difficult and to, to push through the most difficult times in my life. And I'm, I'm so thankful for the, the volunteers in my youth ministry and my youth pastor and everyone in my local church that continued to shepherd me and disciple and pray for me even when I wasn't really wanting it. And so my heart for ministry kind of grew out of that season and wanting to be that same person to pray and disciple and walk alongside young people, particularly through difficult times. And also through the fantastic times of uh, the joy that little siblings can be. I'm a younger sibling, so just, you know, that joy. I'm trying to be sarcastic, it wasn't really working. Um, <laughs> but just, you know, the, the great and the difficult times to just be able to show kiddos and youth students and young adults just how great God is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you, we were just singing the song of he's the firm foundation upon which I stand. It, it made me think of a time when I was in a, a ladies worship setting in SoCal. And y'all probably don't have these, but we have these things called earthquakes. Y'all have these <laughs> things called tornadoes where I'm like, okay, that's weird. Um, but yeah, the, the ground literally shakes. And so we were kind of singing a, a song talking about that, about Christ is the firm foundation upon which I stand. And then all of a sudden we just get these big speakers that we have hanging from the ceiling that just start rocking and the chairs start shaking. We get a, probably a four, 4.5 earthquake. And it was just this incredible reminder of Christ is the solid ground upon which we stand. And um, so I just, that's kind of my heart for ministry. I really wanna teach you guys if I can through the way that I live and through showing you the beauty and the love in the scriptures, just how good God is and how he loves you just so much more than we could ever imagine. Cool. So we need to be careful when we're singing about the Holy Spirit. We don't have a tornado <laughs> come through. So, okay. Um, and, and I just wanted to touch back a little bit on your call. Um, uh, you started out in, in college uh, studying music. Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of transitioned uh, to ministry. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so initially my first year of college, I had been, well, pre previously I'd been a really big, what we call band nerds. Um, so my primary instrument was bassoon. I know most of you probably never heard of that. Think of like a giant oboe with a metal mouthpiece called a vocal. Um, it's a German instrument, it's really beautiful. And so uh, that was kind of- We have room of, for a bassoon in the praise band? 
I've done it with a saxophone before as well. I doubled it on saxophone and flute, yeah. but. Okay. Um, Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I really had a heart for music and a, a joy for that that I found in my developmental years. I feel you, buddy. I want to take a nap too. Um, and so just uh, wanted to kind of use that as my ministry in teaching music to young students. And so initially my first year of college, I was a music education major, which meant I wanted to teach music to students. And then kind of just through that season, I had been considering vocational ministry, particularly the youth ministry, and had considered double majoring for a while, and then ultimately it just became this something that I can't not do. And I just had this heart on, this burden on my heart to just go and be walking with students through difficult times and good times in life and just showing them the, you know, the goodness of the scriptures and just how much more depth there is to Christ and to God and who he is and who he calls us to be. And so ultimately I decided to switch majors and then transferred schools to study ministry. Okay. So you went to Biola, uh, which is uh, Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Los Angeles, right. Um, and you got your degree in? Christian ministries with an emphasis or concentration in youth ministry. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and want to invite you again after the service. Cast will be in the uh, foyer and you can kind of uh, introduce yourself and say hi, uh, but tonight will be a, a great opportunity to do that, um, maybe with a little bit more space and time. So I uh, appreciate you coming, and we'll be seeing you. Thank you. All right, now the kids are dismissed. Head on downstairs. You can find Molly in the back. And while um, they're heading down, Luke uh, four or seven forty seven says uh, he was forgiven uh, much, loves much. He was forgiven little, loves little. And one of the things that as as we begin to talk about the uh, Apostle Paul and his ministry. Um, understanding why this person, this guy, uh, was such a phenomenal force uh, for the gospel during his lifetime. Um, he planted uh, dozens of churches all throughout Asia Minor and Europe and uh, wrote almost virtually half of the New Testament. He wrote 13 letters uh, in the New Testament. He influenced uh, Luke, who wrote Luke and Acts, um, there's uh, some tradition says he may have written uh, the book of Hebrews as well. So possibly up to 16 books of the Bible of the New Testament um, were influenced or written by Paul out of 27. And his life was such a uh, inspiration to anybody who 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 reads through Scripture and you understand what he did and how he lived and and how he communicated, and how he gave his life tirelessly um, over and over and over. He was uh, beaten, he was flogged, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he, he was imprisoned over and over, and eventually he was martyred. And this life, it seems so unreal that somebody would do all this for the gospel. And what you see um, in this passage in Luke 7:47 is this spiritual principle, this idea that Paul's uh, fervency and his energy for the gospel is, is almost in direct uh, contrast to his energy and his fervency for destroying the church in his early life. That he was one of the first and primary persecutors of the church, um, destroying and tearing it down, putting people in prison, and having a hand in killing uh, the early believers, and then he becomes uh, this tremendous force. And what happens in the middle is that he, be, he is um, transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit through an encounter with Jesus. He, he has an encounter with grace and mercy, and he understands that everything that he had been pursuing um, was a misrepresentation and a misunderstanding of who God is and who he was, 
and he gets clarity on that. He gets confirmation in the truth, and everything changes. And here's what we want to understand as we walk through Paul's life and ministry is that his transformation is, in one sense, unique. It's unique to him, just like all of our transformations are unique to us. But the kind of person that he was as a believer is the same kind of person that God calls all of us to be. We put people like Paul on a pedestal and we say, man, I could never be like that. But the reality is that God is calling all of us to live out the power of the Holy Spirit and the transformation that he's given to each of us in the way that, that he's called us, in the way that he's He's uh, given us the opportunity in the environment that we're in and the family that we're in and the workplaces that we're in and the schools that we're in, that there's no difference between the Holy Spirit's power at work in him and the Holy Spirit's power at work in you. Amen? And so we're going to look at uh, Paul. Uh, this is a, just a brief introduction to the life of Paul, but we're going to talk about and look at um, really where he came from before we go into... Um, what he really did for God and his kingdom and the church. So let's stand as we read God's word this morning. Acts 9. And just the first couple of verses here. It says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, this is Christianity, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And Father, we, uh, we look at Paul and we see that he is uh, a person ready to go on mission uh, to destroy the church. And Lord, how you get a hold of his heart and redirect him uh, to be on mission for you is miraculous. It's inspiring. It's amazing and wonderful, Lord, and uh, we thank you that it is, in one sense, it's not uncommon. Lord, you call each and every person to experience that same grace, that same mercy, that same love and forgiveness, to love you greatly, to live for you um, boldly, consistently, Lord, authentically, and loudly. <laughs> and Lord, we pray that we would, that we would uh, take hold of the same grace that took hold of Paul and let it do its same work in us that we might be your ambassadors Lord that we might be your missionaries that we would go and and communicate uh, the truth of your word and the truth of the gospel to anyone and everyone however wherever whenever Lord uh, we would not be afraid to do that um, but that we would be your people the way that you've designed us to be in Jesus name amen Amen. So what's happening in the early church when Paul is beginning to um, seek to tear it down and destroy it is that stepping back a little bit to Pentecost and we've been through some of these scriptures we understand the Holy Spirit came down um, was poured out on the the congregation of the Jewish people basically in uh, Jerusalem at the temple Peter is preaching the gospel 3,000 people get saved in one day, and the church just explodes onto the scene, okay? The church begins right then and there. And then, as that continues, what happens is that thousands of more people are added to the church. And so, daily, people are being added to the church. The gospel is going out. People are receiving Christ. People are getting saved. People are receiving the Holy Spirit, getting baptized. And it's just growing like wildfire, so that uh, just in a very short amount of time, there are 5,000 people, it says, that are gathering in the temple courts uh, as Christians, okay? In the Jewish temple, they're gathering as Christians, worshiping the Messiah, and uh, it's beginning to really change the, the, the demographics of Jerusalem uh, to a degree that now they have to figure out what they're going to do with these people. But before that happens, the apostles have to figure out how to manage this huge growing body of believers. And so there are 12 apostles. They are... Uh, teaching the scriptures. They're trying to disciple people and, and help them to learn and grow, uh, but they're also dealing with practical issues of, of how to feed people and how to deal with logistics uh, of all these people coming and going. And so what they do is they ask the church to appoint seven 
what we call deacons. And, and that, all that word means is servants. And what those people are going to be, uh, are, they're going to be people who manage the daily life of the, the believers. They're going to deal with the food distribution. They're going to deal with conflict. They're going to deal with, you know, discipleship and growth and those kinds of things. And the apostles are going to focus intently on uh, preaching the word and prayer and church growth and, and getting churches started in other locations. So what happens right away is you see seven chosen. One of those is Stephen. Anybody know Stephen from the New Testament in the, gospel, in the, uh, the book of Acts? Raise your hand. What is he famous for? Not just being a deacon, but what else? Okay, he was martyred. He's the first Christian martyr um, in the church. It says that Stephen in, in chapter 6, this is Acts 6, 8, says he was full of grace and power. He was doing great wonders and signs among the people. He was a person that was so full of the Holy Spirit that he was actually participating in some way like an apostle in this ministry. Um, he had healing power. He could do wonders. He could do signs. He could confirm the preaching of the gospel with miracles. That's basically what that means. In verse 10, it says, They could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So Stephen is confounding and refuting the, the, the greatest minds of his day, the Jewish minds, the, the theologians, not because he is necessarily trained and educated, but because he has the power of the Holy Spirit and he, know, he knows the Savior. And they can't stand against it. And so what happens is when people cannot argue with you effectively, what do they begin to do almost immediately? They attack you, what? Personally. And they begin an attack on Stephen uh, personally, and they drag him before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is basically the religious court of the Jewish people. Uh, so it's the high priest, and it, and it is a, a group of people uh, made up of the leaders of the Jewish people to deal with religious conflicts, theological differences, and questions about the law, and those kinds of things. And Stephen stands before them, and he begins to present a very biblical argument for the power and the work of the Holy Spirit and the, the truth and the prophecy of the Messiah. They cannot argue against him, but they get so infuriated with him that they immediately have a mob reaction and they grab him and they, out, of, out of the Sanhedrin, outside of town, and they stone him in violent fury. And it is illegal for them to do that. They don't have the power. They don't have the, the legal right. It has not been granted to them by the Roman government. They do it because they are furious with him, and they do it uh, illegally. And, but they get away with it. So what begins to happen, uh, stepping back real quick, Paul, known as Saul at that point, was there when that happened. And it says that he gave his approval uh, at his death that he was there giving the thumbs up. Now, I don't know if he had a vote. I don't know if he was just cheering him on. He was watching the coats. He didn't actually throw a rock. It doesn't say that. But he's there saying, yep, this absolutely should happen. It needs to happen. Good going, guys, and let's keep doing this. So in chapter 8 of Acts, what happens? It says, Saul approved of his execution. There arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, which I find kind of odd why the apostles were not targeted in this persecution. But for whatever reason, they stayed in Jerusalem. Uh, but it says in verse 2, devout men buried Stephen, made great lamentation over him. There, Stephen was a good guy regardless if you agreed with him or not. Okay, And they were mourned his death. Saul was ravaging the church Entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And what begins to happen is that because they got away with this murder, this illegal you know, situation of persecuting and uh, martyring Stephen, they, they get the, the gumption, okay, however you want to say that, to say, let's keep doing this. Let's pursue Christians wherever we find them. Let's put them in jail. And they begin to uh, radically pursue the church. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how persecution has always worked. 
And then in chapter 9, this is the passage that we read, Paul is still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Notice it doesn't say that he's arguing with them reasonably, that he's trying to discuss with them about why their faith is wrong and why they need to come back to you know, correct Jewish belief. or any. He's threatening them in order to intimidate them, in order to frighten them, and to silence them. And this is what persecution is and has always been and still is today. Wherever you see persecution, this is really the, the underlying uh, desire of the enemy. Whether it results in death or imprisonment or torture or anything like that, which it does happen all over the world. We see it all the time. But in our country, what we see, not so much the, the death and imprisonment and torture, what, what we see is the intimidation, the fear tactics, the sense of, of um, silencing those that we disagree with and we have a growing, and this is what I think is more and more alarming to me, okay? We have a growing sense that as a Christian, I don't know if you feel this or not. I, I feel this. I see it. Um, I don't think I'm alone in this. But we have this growing sense that it's not really politically correct to, to even be a Christian these days. Like, it's kind of like, like, you're weird if you're a Christian. Like, you're, you're odd. Like, that's just not something that, that is even healthy for your psyche to be a Christian. And it's, I mean, I've heard the language that, that for Christian parents to drag their kids to church is abusive. And, and to teach them the Bible, that's, you know, you're, you're brainwashing your kids. You need to let them believe whatever they want to believe. And you shouldn't be really trying to force them to believe what you believe. You ever heard that kind of stuff? Now, let me say it this way. There is one truth. What we understand is God has revealed who he is. He has revealed who we are. He has revealed the, the essence of what it means to be human. He has revealed the essence of what it means to be saved what it means to go to heaven, and how that process works through Jesus. He's revealed it in his word. This book, from beginning to end, cover to cover, is God's inspired and revealed truth. When this book gets cast aside, and now we are in a free-for-all for trying to figure out what truth is according to however you, the individual, feel at any given moment, where are we going to be? Every human being is going to come up with their own version of what they think is the truth, and we're going to be in absolute chaos. And what I think is beginning to happen is that we're starting to see that process begin in our country. And how it is beginning and how it, I think it's going to progress is that Christians, who are not going to be dragged off to jail right away... <laughs> or killed, probably. I mean, if the First Amendment continues to stand, I think we'll, we'll be okay for quite a while. But the process is this. Just shut up about what you believe. Have you already seen that happen? You can't talk about your faith in school. You can't talk about your faith in your workplace. You can't talk about your faith on certain social media platforms. <laughs> They'll shut you down. They don't want to hear that stuff. It's, that's fine for you privately. It's not really okay for you publicly. And it's definitely not okay for you to, quote, unquote, proselytize or try to share your faith with somebody else and encourage them to believe what you believe. This is persecution. And it's not to the degree of losing your life. It's not to the degree of going to jail yet for most here. But it, it's the start of that because what's going to progress from there is this is what we believe, hate language. It's, it's intolerant and therefore um, it's not legal for you to say those things because it hurts people's feelings. And Christians, I don't, do you, do you feel like this or not? I just don't know. But Christians are beginning to feel intimidated 
to say, oh, maybe I shouldn't say anything. And because, you know, faith is a personal thing, right? It is a personal thing. But it doesn't mean it's a private thing. Personal and private are two different things. Personal means no one is going to heaven on the coattails of somebody else. That, that's personal. I have to have a personal faith in Jesus. I have to have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ and accept him for myself. That's personal. Private is I never talk about that with anyone. Do you see the difference? So it is personal, but it's not private. And what the enemy wants to do is to confuse those two words in our culture. You can have a personal faith, and they, but they change the language right away and say, but you need to keep it private. And what we know, and what I think we know, is that I cannot keep this private. I absolutely am, am required to make it public to tell people about what I believe because this is the truth. And there are no other versions of the truth that are going to save anyone. So if I don't share the truth, the only truth, then they will not have access to the God that can save them. And so the persecution of Paul in the early days, it didn't really matter if it ended in death or imprisonment or loss of, of your possessions or whatever, you know, legal action they could take. It, it, the point was to silence the Christians. And for 2,000 years, this is what persecution has always been, and it still is. Whenever you feel intimidated, fearful, and reject, and, and rejection's not always persecution, okay? Some people just don't want to hear what you have to say, and that's fine. They don't have to. They don't have to respond to it. They don't have to accept it. But when you begin to feel the pressure to not say anything because somebody says that's wrong of you to share it, now you're, you're getting a sense of persecution. And this should embolden us, motivate us to make sure that we will not be silenced. I personally, this is just personal, okay? It's just how God made me and I don't know why. I hate feeling manipulated. I hate it. Which means this, that when, when I feel like somebody's trying to turn the dial down on, on communicating the, the truth of the gospel, then what do I want to do? I want to turn it up. You want to make it more politically correct and, and don't, don't be offensive, then I almost like want to go to the extreme of like, well, let's just... Here's what the Bible actually just says, and, and it's going to hurt people's feelings. Because the Bible's going to call us out as sinners in order to make us aware that we need a Savior. Now, that's not necessarily 100% healthy, okay? I understand that. But we do need a Holy Spirit-empowered sense of motivation to make sure that when you feel that somebody's trying to intimidate and silence you, that you... You say, absolutely not. I will not be quiet about what I know is the truth. Because I see that that is the enemy winning. And I'm not going to allow that to happen. It's not just about me. I, I believe what I believe, and I know that I'm ready to go to heaven at any moment but it's about the next person and the next generation and the next community and, and the next country. It's about the other people that they need to hear it and see it and understand it. And when the church stops communicating it, then it does die out in certain areas. And lies and darkness begin to creep in where it used to be the gospel was the main thing. We see that happen. There are places in this world, many places around the world, where the gospel was front and center and through persecution, through the schemes of the enemy. I'm way off topic at this point, I'm sorry. But the church died and other things grew up in its place. And it's up to us to make sure it doesn't happen here. Amen? So Paul, um, he is the foremost persecutor of the church. And what happens is he is not afraid to tell people. Acts is 
um, a firsthand account of his life. He was the traveling companion of Luke. Luke was the traveling companion of Paul. They were friends, and Paul communicated his story to Luke. Luke wrote it down in the book of Acts. In chapter 22, he, he declares it this way. He says, I'm a Jew. This is Paul, born in Tarsus, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict or strictest manner of the law of our fathers. Gamaliel, if you don't know, he was the foremost. He was the one that if you could have any rabbi teach you, he, it was Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the son of Hillel. Okay, I mean, you're like, I don't know who Hillel is. But Hillel, we still have the, the tradition of Hillel now. It is a famous, it is probably the most famous and popular and standalone teaching of rabbinic tradition even to this day. Gamaliel was his son. Paul was trained by Gamaliel. He had the highest credentials imaginable, okay? Whatever credentials you think are the highest imaginable in our day, that's what Paul had. He had the doctorate. He had the PhD. He had the whole, the whole thing. He had the credentials. He was trained by the best, and he missed the gospel, he knew the Old Testament. He saw the laws and the rituals and, and the legalism, and he missed the Savior. So he says, um, trained under Gamaliel, I, I persecuted the way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness from them. I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those who are who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. He's basically saying, you know, as far as credentials go, among the Jewish people, he, he not only did he have the educational pedigree, he also had the, the zeal and the passion to try to destroy the church. And it was to them that was high praise that he would actually go on church-destroying mission trips. That was what Paul was after. Galatians, he says, uh, 1.13, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. Just look at the language that he uses to talk about his old life. In 1 Timothy uh, 1.13, he says, Formerly, I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent of the church and of God. A blasphemer. This is the language that he uses to talk about himself. Somebody asked me about that um, sin of blasphemy because I said the, the New Testament, Jesus actually says there's one sin that's unforgivable. Have you ever heard this before? One sin that will not be forgiven, not in this life, not in the next. It's kind of like pretty alarming if you think about it. It says it's the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Let me explain what that basically is. What, in that particular situation, what was happening was that Jesus was performing miracles the people who saw it knew it was by the power of the Holy Spirit, and yet they attributed it to Satan. They verbally said, knowing that it was the Holy Spirit, but they verbally said it was Satan that's doing this. Jesus said, that is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That is not for forgivable. The Holy Spirit is not going to say, eh, that's okay about that one. So unless you have seen a miracle of the Holy Spirit, knowing that it's a miracle of the Holy Spirit, and then verbally attributed it to Satan, okay, you have not committed the sin of blasphemy of the, against the Holy Spirit. Is that clear? Just in case anybody's like, oh, I don't know, I kind of, I, maybe I mocked God sometimes. Jesus says, you can mock Jesus. He'll forgive you for that. But don't do that other thing. Here's something else, though. There's one other sin that God will not forgive. It's not that he can't forgive, but he won't if it's not repentant. Of course, any, he won't forgive any sin that's not repentant. But there's one sin that he won't forgive, which is the sin of pride. And here's why pride is such a, a big deal. And this is why Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. And he was, would highlight how he blasphemed, how he persecuted the church, how he was violent, how he tried to destroy the church. Paul was stuck in pride. He understood the law, he understood the Bible, but he came to a conclusion in his heart that he did not need God. 
This is what pride is. I don't need God. I'm good enough. What do you think is the, the biggest sin of our day in our country? It's, it's exactly that. It's just the fact that I'm not really a bad person. I'm okay. I don't really need God. What do I need to be forgiven for? What have I done that's so bad? I haven't murdered anybody. And even if I had murdered somebody, they deserved it. Kind of a joke, but... Thank you, Marcia. You look very concerned. <laughs> I haven't, by the way, murdered anyone, just so you know. But what's going on here is that Paul is the, not literally, but metaphorically, figuratively, he is the Pharisee that Jesus was addressing in the Luke passage that I read at first. What was happening in that story was this. Jesus had come into the, the home of a Pharisee, and he had sat down to dinner, and this woman who was absolutely lost in a life of sin was weeping and kissing Jesus' feet and, and washing his feet with her tears and drying his feet with her hair. And the Pharisee, thinking in his mind, Jesus knew what he was thinking in his mind, but the Pharisee said if, in his head, if he knew who was touching him, he would, he would not let her near him. And Jesus responded. He says, those who have uh, been forgiven little love little. Those who have been forgiven much love much. Pharisee, he says, when I came into your house, you didn't give me any water to wash my hands. You didn't give me the normal, typical kiss on the cheek when you, for hospitality when you walk into somebody's home, like a normal greeting. You didn't even do that. I've been sitting here, and this lady has not stopped weeping and basically mourning over her sin, knowing that she has a Savior in front of her, longing for that Savior. She's forgiven. You who are self-righteous in your pride are still lost in your sin. Those who love little are forgiven. Who are forgiven little love little. Those who are forgiven much love much. The Pharisee needed the same Savior that that woman needed. The pride, the sin of pride that he had was preventing him from seeing that he needed a savior. It's the same sin that Paul dealt with. Why Paul would go after, try to kill people who were professing faith in Jesus Christ, knowing what the Bible said, backwards and forwards, until he came into an encounter with Jesus, did not get his need for grace. And so after that, what does he say? I'm the chief of sinners. Among sinners, I am the foremost not because really he's done so many bad things, but because he understood what a great God we have and what a great sinner we all are. His pride was destroyed. Not just his sinful activity, but the, his pride that says, I don't need God. What happens is when you encounter grace, it's not just about the sins that you've committed. It's not just about the things that you've done in your past or the thoughts that you've had or the words that have come out of your mouth or anything like that. The issue is I come to a, an understanding and an agreement with God that he is perfect and I cannot achieve that perfection in anything that I do, but he offers it to me freely through Jesus Christ. And so I am forgiven much and I can love much. And how the gospel works in each and every one of us, how, how grace works in you and me. Because I thought, how do, we, how do we get grace working? You ever think about that? I want more grace in my life. I want more forgiveness in my life. I want more love of God in my life. I want more of a, a connection with him, a, a sense of his nearness. I want more of him. How do you get that? You just go into a dark room and pray until it happens? And there's some truth to that, <laughs> okay? Quiet time, alone time, get into your Bible, pray. I mean, definitely do those things. If you want to go walk around town, you know, on a, a prayer walk, you want to go in the country and tree stand and, and pray there, whatever. Go in your car and drive around and pray. But I'm telling you this, that how grace is going to really be at work in you is when you get it out of you. You start applying it to other people, communicating it to other people, and you don't keep it to yourself when you actually share it with others, then it grows. And this is one of the issues that we have, why grace, I think, is so anemic in so many Christians is because we, we're, we want it for us. But a selfish grace is not really a, a grace that God loves. 
God loves a generous grace, which means that we offer it to other people. We communicate it to other people. We share it with people. We invite people to understand that we communicate it through our life. We communicate it through our words, that we continue to make sure that we will not be quiet about the God who loves us and the Savior that saved us. Amen? And when we keep getting the word out, grace grows. And it, it doesn't just grow in other people. It begins to grow in us. I begin to sense it more, feel it more, experience it more, and love my Lord more. Amen? Father, we love you. We thank you and we praise you, God. And we're going to say and we're going to praise and we're going to sing that. We just, we love you. We, we thank you. We want to be people who um, are refusing to be silenced, refusing to be quiet about the great grace that we have, the great God that we serve, the great Savior who gave a, a great sacrifice to give us a great reward. Not only are our souls cleansed, but we have eternity to look forward to. Lord, we're, we're all rushing towards it. How we don't see that, I don't know. We're rushing towards eternity. We're, we're heading there so fast. We thank you that we have nothing to fear through Jesus. When that time comes, Lord, we are hopeful. We are expectant. We are peaceful. We are joyful that the, the turmoil and the confusion of this world will be over and there will be something so glorious and good and without end in store. And God, we want to invite and communicate that to as many people as possible. Help us never to hesitate <laughs> to share Jesus, Lord, with people. Even if it's just saying, I'm a Christian. Just communicating that, that we believe. Lord, I pray that you would use that, that you would build your kingdom on it for your glory. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. My invitation to you this morning is simply that, an invitation to respond to the gospel in your life um, and then communicate that to somebody else. And, and here's what I'm pretty sure. Many people, if not most, have somebody in their life, on their mind, that they know needs to hear about Jesus. And when that person comes to your mind in prayer and in worship, you may just commit yourself to God. God, I'm going to respond to that somehow. You have social media, you have email, you have text message, you have invitation to church, you can share you know, things that are going on here, you can, you can ask them to come over and, and talk, whatever you want to do. But there are so many ways to communicate the gospel. Amen? just committing yourself to, to doing that somehow with that person. That's the invitation. For some of you, I know that th you need that invitation for you. <laughs> you, need the, you need the gospel. You need Jesus for you. And we always invite you, if, if you are recognizing your need for a Savior today, please do not hesitate to say yes to him. I've never met a person yet who's regretted it. Amen? The altar is open. If you want to commit anything to the Lord, um, physically come and, and lay it down, then we welcome you to do that. Let's stand and sing.